I think so. All right. Thank you, everybody. We have reached the last speaker of the conference. David Nolan's going to be talking to us about immutable data structures and other things. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, so this talk is called Lambda: The Ultimate Interface. Um, I don't. It's gonna. Uh, this probably isn't gonna make sense until the very last few slides, but uh, bear with me. Um, so. User interface programming, I've been doing this now for about 10 years, uh, various places. I worked at Princeton University. I worked at a mapping startup. I worked at the New York Times for four years. Um, I worked on the MoMA redesign back in 2009. I uh, worked on um, the New Museum. So I've been doing a lot of, a lot, just a lot of stuff around user interface programming on the web. Um, and so uh, excited about user interface programming but uh, curious about how we can make that um, activity simpler. I think that user interfaces end up, tend to be uh, often more complex than they need to be. And so we'll talk about some possible ways to mitigate the complexity you, you encounter. Um, so a little bit about me, more about me. I work at Cognitech these days. I'm no longer at the Times. Um, I work on a immutable relational database called Datomic, which is pretty cool. You should check it out. Uh, I also work on um, ClojureScript. Uh, which is a dialect of Clojure that compiles to JavaScript. Uh, Clojure is also something that Cognitech uh, stewards, which is a immutable sort of Lisp uh, that runs in the JVM. Uh, so the two big targets are the JVM and JavaScript. Um, but anyways, uh, that takes us to this photo, which kind of you know sets uh, sets up this talk a bit. Uh, that's John McCarthy. He invented Lisp, a lot, many other things. Uh, right next to him is Ed Fredkin, which is um, an Im important in the context of the data structures that I'm going to describe. I'm not going to assume that you're familiar with them, but that's Ed Fredkin. He invented the tree. Uh, that's T-R-I-E. Um, uh, some people pronounce it tri these days, but he says it's tree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're doing any sort of user interface programming these days, there's a good chance you're doing JavaScript. I mean, even though mobile is extremely important, a lot of companies are coming, re coming to the realization that really having separate teams and code base, completely separate teams and code bases for Android and iOS and the web is kind of a bummer. Uh, and a lot of uh, companies are switching their thinking around JavaScript because JavaScript is one of these things that actually runs, any, uh, runs everywhere. Um, so JavaScript, unfortunately, though, was designed in a very short amount of time under a lot of pressure um, by, this, by this man. Fortunately, he did make some good decisions. Uh, JavaScript is a uh, relatively simple language, at least it started out that way. It is going to get uh, more complicated pretty soon. Um, but at least it's, it, it's, it's the essence of it is quite nice. It um, supports uh, functions as first class values, um, and it has a kind of a clever sort of object model, um, which is prototypal inheritance, which is borrowed from this research language at Sun called self. So that's where things kind of got started. So it, it's, what's funny about JavaScript is JavaScript was really designed to do very trivial things, and it was actually oriented towards uh, non-experts, um, because the web, um, as sort of um, Tim Berners-Lee sort of envisioned it when he first came, this is the image of the first web browser running on a Next machine, uh, was the, the idea wasn't to like recreate the desktop. It was just to share some documents and to like have links, right? That was the idea behind the browser, uh, shared documents, not replacing um, uh, generic interfaces. Sadly, that's not how it turned out. Um, for various reasons, um, uh, people, wanted to push the browser much further because it ended up being far more popular than anybody could imagine. And then there was a lot of pressure to take this language that, again, was designed in a very short time, uh, designed for, um, again, for non-programmers, really, uh, now had to be used uh, to build very serious applications. And this is the world we live in today, right? So um, people don't actually, you know, people, there are still regular websites, and it's great that there's some websites are document-oriented, but there are uh, extremely sophisticated applications now. Um, that uh, do lots of interesting things, uh, behaviors that we're used to uh, from desktop applications. And so then the question becomes, um, you know, how do you make JavaScript better suited to this, this task of building complex user interfaces? Uh, again, so, so, you know, a, a lot of the challenges with this, if you've done this before, it's, it's, you know, it's largely because the web browser was designed around this, right? This has nothing to do with user interfaces, right, at all. Uh, this is the document object model. Um, it's about documents. It's oriented around documents. 
that has a hard-coded event model which may not correspond to anything you, you actually want or need. Um, so people are hacking around this. Uh, and, then, and then things got even worse because back in the olden days, right, before people took JavaScript seriously, what did you do? You wrote, you wrote a web server, you loaded a page, you were done. You moved on. Um, but then this whole Ajax thing happened. Does anybody remember Ajax? <laughs> uh, that phrase. Um, so this is actually from the original post from Adaptive Path in 2005 where they're like, this is going to change, this is going to make everything better. Now, um, now your JavaScript, instead of just like making something blank, you're going to like constantly talk back to the server. This isn't, now, you know, you're sort of living, you now have this problem where like, whereas before you could sort of pretend it's just a stateless page, now you really have to deal with the fact that you have a distributed system, you have state on the, uh, on the client, and you have to r constantly reconcile that with that with whatever state you have on the server. So, you know, this is just to sort of illustrate some of the difficulties. Um, which I think some of you are familiar with if you work on the web. Uh, jQuery appeared, and jQuery was supposed to solve all our problems. It was supposed to, you know, make the DOM easier to use. I don't know if you guys were there back before jQuery, uh, and you had to, like, memorize all these different DOM APIs. It was not fun. Uh, jQuery, but jQuery only um, addressed uh, the symptom. It didn't actually uh, deal with the fundamental problem. Um, and what's really funny about this is that, again, JavaScript was designed for, again, for not for, for programmers, right? Uh, JavaScript did, doesn't ha didn't have a way to, like, really deploy artifacts. There's no standard way to do this. Um, there's no standard way to declare your dependencies. You just have to, like, write script tags into the page, right? Uh, there's no notion of modules, right? There's no modularity. This is not, this is not a, a part of the language. I mean, from a language design perspective, it's a, it's a catastrophe. Um, and... Sadly, Java failed in the browser, right? For many reasons, even though it had a better story uh, from a design perspective, there are many other problems um, that it had which allowed JavaScript to succeed, and now we're sort of crawling back. Um, things are looking better. Uh, things like ES6, you're going to get modules. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of community innovation around dependency management, which is really exciting. Um, and if you, if you follow the JavaScript world, you know, check out things like Browserify or Webpack. Uh, it's cool stuff. Um, so I want to talk about three things. So uh, something that I think people don't really think about um, is sort of like the high-level architecture. If we're really going to build uh, a sophisticated UI, um, let's actually talk about system architecture. People often court in themselves like, I'm the back-end person and I'm the front-end person, and these wor two worlds don't really uh, communicate very well. Uh, so there are three, three things I want to talk about with regards to um, a suitable architecture for building uh, just, you know, basically, it doesn't matter if you're doing iOS, Android, or, or the web. How would you build such a system? So the thing I think you always have to can be concerned with is modularity. How do you preserve modularity in your system? Um, how do you deal with performance? This is particularly a problem on the web. Um, page, page latency is a huge concern. Um, and then state. This is like, you know, almost every problem boils down to this. We're, if you're looking at an MVC framework, Knockout, Backbone, Ember, Angular, React, they all try to solve the same problem. How do we uh, deal with the problem of state? Um, a lot of these things don't deal with the problem of state across the network, though, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. Um, so, uh, the thing that, that, that if there's anything that I, that I can convince you of is that when you design or architect a system, to always think about global optimization. Uh, almost everything I'm going to talk about that I that I like in this talk is from the perspective of how can you globally optimize your system, right? Not like little fixes, but how can we have the right design up front so that we get Global optimization, global optimization, global optimization, global optimization. Right? Don't make decisions that aren't oriented around that um, because it'll in inevitably lead to a mess. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about very briefly is modularity. Um, so I'm only going to point out a specific set of technologies. They're actually somewhat relevant to um, a solution that we've already picked, uh, particularly for ClojureScript, but it's just something to consider, uh, uh, the benefits therein derived. So modularity is an interesting one. I've already mentioned some of the JavaScript solutions to that problem for packaging dependencies and such. So something that's really often ignored is uh, Google Clojure. So Google, I think, believe started on this project in 2009. Um, it's a horribly documented project, uh, which is probably why no nobody uses it, but it's really powerful. Um, it's what Google uses to um, deal with JavaScript. Uh, it's fantastic. It has a standard library that's about 300,000 lines uh, of JavaScript. Uh, and you can depend on any of these things. It's probably the most tested uh, front-end library outside of things like jQuery. The cool thing is that you have this huge standard library, and then you have the Google Clojure compiler, uh, which is a really amazing multi-pass compiler over JavaScript. It does whole program optimization. 
So this is not like, so you have this, this trend in the JavaScript world of some things like uglify or whatever, and those are only really minifiers. They only collapse symbols, they make things shorter, but they don't do whole program optimization. So Google Closure actually does things like constant folding, inlining, and the most powerful one um, is dead code elimination, or it's otherwise known as tree shaking. And so what's cool about tree shaking dead code el elimination is say I have a library that has 10,000 lines of code in it, and my, my library includes it as a dependency, and I only use one function. Um, through tree shaking and dead code elimination, it's going to eliminate all the code that's not actually in the real call graph of your program. This is huge. Uh, we leverage it and we love it. It's awesome. Uh, I'm really surprised that um, JavaScript still, still, there are no JavaScript minifiers that do this except for Google Closure. Uh, there's a, there, Google Closure has a custom namespace mechanism mostly because such, there wasn't such a thing back when they started on this project. Um, it, what's nice about it, it is erased from the production artifact, so it's, it's, it's um, compiled away, uh, so it's not so bad. The other nice thing about Google Closure is that it does have uh, uh, processing capabilities for uh, AMD, which is an, an asynchronous module loading format, and CommonJS. So you can still include CommonJS or AMD-based uh, libraries, and it will compile them into the, into the same thing. Uh, there's also pending support for ES6 modules. And this is, so this is great. So Google Closure has been doing this stuff for six years, but they're going where um, JavaScript is going. Um, you'll be able to deal with all these different um, conventions. So performance. So this is the other big thing to think about when you're building a system. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to really talk too much today about like the performance of the JavaScript itself. Uh, JavaScript used to be ridiculed as a language that's impossible to optimize. Um, you, turns out if you spend enough money on it, that's not true. Um, <laughs> So uh, V8 was by Lars Bach, who's got famous from doing working on Hotspot, uh, which is the Java virtual machine. So his team put together V8. V8 is really incredible. Uh, for a long time, it was um, sort of leading the JavaScript race. Uh, but actually, um, Apple is, is starting to catch up with JavaScript Core, which is their um, JavaScript engine. Um, the JavaScript engines have become extremely sophisticated. So if you've ever looked at the JVM and seen all the different types of tiered compilation that it does, uh, JavaScript engines do the exact same thing. Uh, JavaScript Core has four tiers. It has uh, a, a base interpreter, it has a fast interpreter, uh, it has a DFG JIT, and then it has this crazier thing which uses LLVM, um, which uh, can do crazy things. Um, so again, there's, there's some benefit here. So again, so the engines are doing all this optimization. So it turns out that a lot of this stuff like constant folding and inlining that Google Closure used to do that was great uh, back in 2009 is kind of irrelevant today. Uh, it's not that important. But what Google Closure does do uh, for uh, you in terms of performance um, is that, that that whole program optimization strategy it again wins out. Uh, so when you, have, when you have Google Closure modules, um, so the thing is when you, what people do is they want, I load a page and I have some shared set of code. And then on a different page, I have a different set of code. And so what people have to do is they start to like by hand move the code around so the most minimal set of code gets loaded into the page. You don't have to do this with Google Closure. Google Closure actually employ, uh, employs cross-module code motion. And what this will do is that if, it, if you have a module and there's, some, and there's a shared base and Google Closure sees that this module is the only module that depends on some functionality in the base module, it will move that into the correct place. Uh, the other thing that Google Closure emphasizes, which is great for a page latency is that Google just says no way to waiting on DOM ready. Uh, you just don't wait on DOM ready. Uh, you want the page to be immediately available. Uh, and there's no async loading ever. So basically what you do is you produce N scripts that you can load um, and you just inline them into the page. Uh, and that's good for latency. Okay, that's, just, that's the beginning. Now this is the big part of the talk, state. This is where I'm gonna talk about something maybe more novel to some of you. Uh, so. Uh, I want to talk about uh, sort of immutable data and functional programming. So even if you don't like functional programming, even if you don't like uh, that idea and, you're, and you love object-oriented programming, uh, there's still something to learn from this section because uh, this plays into how um, a lot of the tricks uh, we did were able to make React faster. So I, I work on this closure script library called Ohm and we integrated with React and our, co our programs are faster than React programs by default. React is, is Facebook's uh, UI framework. Um, so let's dig into how this was done. So this is the, sort of the data structure part of the talk. Uh, so 
again, if we don't, even if we're object-oriented programming, you should at least understand the functional programming perspective. And the functional programming perspective is, let's emphasize immutable values, not mutable objects. Um, and basically, in functional programming languages, the idea is you, there's no such thing as changing something. If you want to update something, you just get back a new thing. Uh, you leave the old one unmodified. Uh, so there's this word that people like to use, which is not the traditional usage of this word, which is persistent. Uh, we don't mean persistent in terms of disk. We just mean um, persistent in the sense that we didn't destroy the previous um, value. Uh, and they're fast. And this is actually relatively a relatively new thing. Um, if you've d been doing programming for a while, you're, you're aware of this, you know, you have copy on write data structures, right? So people in the past, uh, as long as the data was small, you could copy on write, no big deal. Um, and then a lot of research has happened in the last 15 years to show how you can actually have um, persistent data structures that are not co they're not a copy on write that have much better uh, update and, and read characteristics. And we'll see how that's possible. Um, but just a quick refresher, uh, they actually work basically conceptually the same way as linked lists, which is like one of the first things you learn. Um, a linked list, you know, if you have a head and a tail and you just pointers and they point, right? Um, what's neat about linked lists, the clever thing about linked lists is that if I append, you know, or I cons onto the head of a list, well, I have a new value, but I didn't destroy the old one, right? This is, this is, the, this is the big idea. If I had an array and I mutate something, boom, whatever that value that array represented before, it's gone. But with linked lists, it has this beautiful property. I put something on the front. It doesn't change what um, the list was before. Uh, and I can even get the tail of, of, um, of that original list, and I can cons on a different head. And I have th uh, three distinct values that share more than 50% of their memory. Right? So this is, that, this is really, really cool. Um, uh, without mutating anything, um, I, I'm getting um, efficiency. Uh, so this is called structural sharing. So we'll see this uh, employed in a more dramatic way momentarily. Uh, so sharing structure is the trick around a lot of these functional data structures. They give you space efficiency, as we saw, um, computational efficiency because you're not copying. Um, uh, the, two, the two big ones that are sort of the foundation of a lot of the fast persistent data uh, structure research are, is array map trees and hash array map trees. Uh, they were invented by the late Phil Bagwell um, at EPFL, which is the home of Scala. Um, and these actually, the original papers, they're, they're, it's, the original papers are very cool. The original versions were actually not immutable, uh, but the design was very interesting and it wasn't hard to tweak uh, to make them into an immutable variant. Uh, so I'm going to talk about one specifically because it's the easiest one to explain, and it's the bitmapped vector tree. Uh, the idea is data will live in the leaves. It's a prefix tree, and we'll see what that means here in a second. It's a bitwise tree. Um, and we're going to look at, uh, examine a concrete version of this called the persistent vector. And so this was uh, sort of innovated by Rich Hickey, who designed Clojure. He took Phil's original research and made an immutable variant of it. Uh, so how does it work? We, it's basically an array of arrays. You just pick, we're going to pick an arbitrary dimension, four. Um, every element of the array points to uh, another array of the same dimension. And those all point to another set of arrays of the same dimension until you get to the bottom, and that's where your values will live. And so here we can imagine that this uh, persistent vector is holding just a bunch of numbers. So the question is, given this structure, how do you find anything? How do you find a particular value? Uh, so there's actually a, way, a very clever way to do this. If you want to find the 106th element, that has, some binary, that has a binary representation. And you can use bit masking. Uh, so Mask off the first two bits. That'll tell you to go down um, index one. Mask off the next two bits. That'll tell you to go to um, index two. Uh, again, index two. And again, index two. And you found your thing. Uh, so obviously, this can't be that expensive because all we had to do was you know, dereference some arrays and do some bit twiddling. Uh, that's, that's really the essence of how they work. It's quite simple. Uh, now, what do we have to do for updating? If you want to update something, uh, all we have to do is replace the, the, the arrays that are on the path. Um, notice we don't have to change any of the other arrays. So this, this, is, this is what I was talking about with structure sharing. None of the other arrays have to be um, updated at all. Uh, so for example, we replaced, we, we replaced the number with the word foo here. Um, and then the question is, well, what, what end should we pick? Four is obviously pretty arbitrary. Um, it turns out, after you do a whole bunch of empirical testing on modern hardware, that 32 is a really good number. This is from the Bagwell paper. 
Um, and the reason it's good is because it's, it is a balance between um, uh, lookup and update, time to update. It's a, it's a good sort of happy place. Um, but 32 is also a very good number for because it's, it's actually a pretty wide branching factor. Um, if you had a persistent vector that was seven levels deep, um, that's 34 billion elements, uh, which is, you know, if, if, if you just imagine 64-bit pointers, we're talking 256 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so this, this is good enough for many programs. Uh, so that brings us to React. So now, if you have some sense that we have persistent data structures, they allow us to, to have things that look like arrays, that have the characteristics of arrays, that have decent performance characteristics. It's not going to be better than a mutable array. That's not, what we're, that's not what we're arguing. What we're arguing is that it collapses the cost to such a small amount that it's, you're willing to take that cost because what you get is that um, you get this more interesting programming model in which you can persist values over time. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see what, what that buys us here in a second. Uh, so we, we have persistent data structures on one side, uh, but we need something else. The data structures are cool, but that doesn't really show us the way of uh, how could we design an interface around immutable values. And so React kind of, kind of opened the door to this. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with React. All right, cool, cool, okay. So, so React did this really clever thing when, they, when it first came out, they kept saying virtual DOM, virtual DOM. And, and what this means is that uh, the way that browsers work, um, accessing the DOM and writing to it is a relatively expensive operation. What happened was that JavaScript used to be really slow. <laughs> DOM was not, what people said the DOM wasn't, it, the DOM was always slow, but people didn't notice the DOM was slow because JavaScript was so much slower, right? And what's happened is that with all this, all, this, all this innovation around JavaScript runtimes, JavaScript is way up here. Anything you're going to do with the DOM is going to be a bottleneck. And what happened was that all these jQuery programs were inside of a loop. You add something to the DOM or you read something from the DOM. The, the performance of that is catastrophic um, because JavaScript is just so fast. And so all React did was they said, let's not operate on the real DOM. We're going to operate on an in-memory representation of the DOM. And so when you apply a bunch of operations, it's all in this virtual thing. And it's almost as if they treat the browser as like a, a, a rendering engine. So you, you batch a bunch of operations on the virtual thing, and then it gets committed. And they apply all the changes at once. So you're, you're never making this mistake of being in a loop and mutating the DOM um, uh, in, the, in the loop. So this is, again, this notion of, of global optimization. So I actually put a benchmark. This, I think, uh, I did it. It was one of the most, my most popular blog posts I've ever done. Uh, I think it was like 150,000 page views in like a week. Um, and, in, and it helped kick off this sort of excitement about React. And so I showed a typical backbone app, which has this problem of being in a loop and reading and writing to the DOM. This is a Google Chrome flame graph, which shows where your time is being spent in your JavaScript application. So that top graph is, is backbone. So that does not a, that's, not a, that's not a very exciting graph from a performance perspective. There's way too much stuff happening. Yeah. Uh, below that, it, it's, a, and it's a, taking a considerably less amount of time, is the React model. Because what's happening in the React model is I've updated the virtual thing, and then um, React applies it as one big commit, and it's just way faster. Uh, so this got a lot of people excited. Um, again, because React gives you something that you want, global optimization, so you're not making these um, mistakes. Okay, so what happens when you take React, which is this sort of functional model um, and, and immutable data structures? So the way that React works that's really beautiful is it actually um, integrates the notion of memoization. And so what I can do is like React is a function. I give it a piece of data and then it creates some virtual DOM, right? And it will, if I give it new data, it does, it does a diff and then actually applies the diff, the minimal set of changes to the DOM. But what's cool about this is that if I have an immutable model where I never destroyed any previous values, I can be in the future, or like I, I, move it, I move one step in time, and I decide I need to roll back. I just need to supply the previous snapshot of the application state, and React will magically uh, calculate the diff, because React is just based on diffing. So this is a, a really cool pixel editor made by this guy, Jack Shadler. He's a, a, a UI dev at Ableton. Uh, he read my post. Uh, he thought I was a liar. He was like, this can't possibly really be any better than, than these other things that people have tried. And so he, he, he took it upon himself to build um, a pixel-based editor uh, that had undo. So like, he wanted to see how easy it is to do undo. Given that I said that it would be trivial, is it actually trivial? 
So he represents the pixel surface as a uh, 64 by 64, which is 4096 pixels. It's one immutable vector. Uh, and then what he does is he, he, you can paint on it, and he's storing every version. And again, because of structural sharing, even as you have tons and tons and tons of edits, because the differences between um, each snapshot is tiny, most of the arrays are shared, it actually is both great for um, uh, efficiency overall, but it's also compact, more compact in memory. It's much more expensive to truly clone the array every single time. So here is uh, this thing. I'm going to, you know, pick a color. And so you see here on the, um, on the, uh, on the right there, there's some undo history. I can click undo. I can click redo. And then, you know, I can scrub. And it's actually will play back in the little preview here on the left. So how much code did he have to write to implement? It, this is not a simple program. Actually, the UI is it's a pretty big program. It's 2,000 lines of code. Um, but how, how much work was it to do, the, to, to do the undo, redo feature, which is normally uh, non, you know, if you've done it before, it's not a whole lot of fun. So here is his, his, his um, file. Uh, it's 60 lines of code. So everything you saw, the, the playback, scrubbing, preview, undo, redo, um, all he has to do, because he has immutable data structures, he just has to save those. He just puts them into a mutable, he actually takes the immutable values, sticks them in something mutable, and when you want to play something back, you just pop the timeline, and because React will do the diff for you, he's done, right? There's nothing for him to do. Uh, uh, undo, which is, again, normally a, a non-trivial thing in this system is, is simpler. And so the idea here is we had, we had this huge source of complexity. We didn't even know that the complexity existed because we were, we were using the wrong model, which is a model based on mutation. Once you say, drop that, let's just use immutable data, we have fast uh, data structures for that, then this traditional source of complexity uh, kind of just evaporates. And people are, people are actually, we're actually taking advantage of this. One of the coolest is actually, uh, so ClojureScript, uh, they, they're not using ClojureScript, but um, Adobe uh, has this um, portfolio product called Behance, and that team is not using uh, ClojureScript, but ClojureScript just compiles to JavaScript. And I, I maintain a library called Mori, which just exposes the data structures to JavaScript. And they're building their entire UI around immutable data because it gives them such, uh, it makes the undo code and redo code uh, considerably simpler. They have to do a lot less work. Uh, there's an, another thing from Facebook now, which is immutable JS. So you don't have to use Mori. So Facebook is now uh, uh, he uh, investing heavily in immutable data structures in JavaScript. It's very cool. Uh, definitely recommend uh, checking that out as well. Okay, so hopefully this, the, the picture is starting to more, be more clear. So this, this is a kind of a new part. I, I, I tend to talk about the, the first portion of my talk a lot. And then, then there's some new stuff. I recently went to the React Facebook conference. And, there, and there's another part of state which nobody really talks about. And that is the state that is not on the client, right? So this is, this is the part that be becomes, rapidly becomes ad hoc. I've showed some principled things, but mostly what people are doing these days is they build some REST endpoint, uh, and then I have to code against that REST endpoint to present something, and then if I need to change something, I have to go ask the server guy to change the query. They decide that's not the right design. They go make a new resource. Then I have to make two calls to the back end to show something, right? So this is, I've, there, every place I've ever worked, this is how people do it. It's crazy, right? It's ridiculous. Um, and I think people are finally starting to see the light. I heard that um, Jafar talked a little bit about JSON graph, uh, which is, which is I think, kind of like, and maybe it's time to think a little bit differently about this problem. Uh, but Facebook is also tackling this with something called Relay and GraphQL. Um, and there's, there, there's actually videos about that from the React conference that are available. You should, you should check it out. Um, so this, but this, this, this problem is fundamental with UI, with UIs, right? So what, what people discovered was that eventually your application state gets complicated enough that you want a real data model, right? You want queries, you want to be able to describe uh, and talk about your, your data in a more expressive way. Writing for loops is not like really what you want to do. You just want to write a query, grab the data you need, and present it. Uh, this is the big idea behind um, Apple's core data, though I think core data ended up being a mess because uh, core data is actually still trying to um, sort of 
take water out of a sinking ship called Orm, right? Right? It's like that's never going to work, right? People have tried in a million ways, and it, it's it's not really not great, right? The idea is you you have SQL, which is great, and then you try to sort of push it into this object model, which never works. Um, core data is you know that's what it is. But but obviously there's a desire, there's something that we want here. Uh, maybe it's not um, uh, so SQL-like. Um, and, and I've already talked about the REST part. So, so thinking past SQL for this problem and thinking past REST for this problem, I think, is extremely important. Um, so this, this, this problem, again, I just want to just reiterate it. So this is something I actually enc en encountered at the New York Times. Uh, this problem of I have something I want to show. There's no query for it yet. There's no endpoint for it yet. And this constant round tripping. Uh, so Facebook announced Relay. I said that. And so Relay is very fascinating. So the way that Facebook works, they have this graph query language called GraphQL. And the, the really cool thing about GraphQL is that it's a graph-oriented query. And so what you get to do, instead of having to write this insane query where you're trying to take a, a table, which is a box, and then trying to present some sort of tree structure, which is what the, the front end actually needs, GraphQL allows you to supply a pattern. So those of you that have been following RDF or the semantic web, so this is like finally a real business reason to care about these things. <laughs> um, so if, if you have um, structured queries that can return structured information, that's really great for the front end. So the way that Relay works is that uh, all your components actually declare their data dependencies, and they only declare the pattern fragment that they need. And it's uh, implemented as a static method on the, on the class. And so what happens is that there's a, a UI tree and of course, there's the, you know what the structure of your app is, and each component talks to the next child, right? But you don't need to, uh, the parent doesn't need to know what the child needs. It says, the parent says, I'm going to call your static method. Tell me the, the piece that you need, and I'll compose your piece into my piece, all the way back up to the root. And uh, the beautiful thing about this is that you can construct the, the query to populate the entire UI in one trip, right? Because it's a, gr it's a graph and pattern-oriented query, right? SQL doesn't really compose in this way, right? You can't just stick little pieces of the structure into a SQL query. But a graph-oriented query, you can do this. It's very natural. You can say, give me your pattern. I compose it with my pattern. I compose it with my pattern. Send the entire thing to the server. Give me the structure that I need. And what you get back is already ready to go. And what does this mean? Say I need to change something in one of my children's views. Do I need to talk to the server guy? No. I don't need to talk to the server guy. I just changed my pattern. There's no coordination now between um, what I need uh, and, and, and what the, um, the backend people need to provide. Uh, so again, so I think this is going to be huge. Uh, I think you're going to be hearing, again, Netflix is talking about it. Facebook is talking about it. Uh, I think you're going to see a sea change around this uh, in the near future. Uh, so, there's, so just you know, plugging, my, uh, plugging something I work on. I work on Datomic. And so Datomic has this. So if you've, if you've been thinking about RDF, you're already thinking in the right way. If you're thinking about data log, you're already thinking in the right way. So Datomic is not SQL. It's actually data log. Uh, and data log is uh, it's the um, terminating fragment of prolog. It's, this is old stuff. Uh, we like old stuff because old stuff often is better than the new stuff. Um, but this top thing is a pattern, right? This top bit is a pattern. It's the structure of the thing that I want. And the result that I get back from the database, it's in the exact same shape that my, that my query was in. So I get back tree structured information, which can trivially populate a UI, because your UI is in a tree, right? That's, that's the shape that you, your UI is already in. Um, so that's a lot of information. Does anything exist uh, that actually implements all these ideas? Uh, no, <laughs> not yet. Uh, but so, th so this is sort of bringing it back to Lambda, the ultimate interface. So, this, so I, again, I've, I've tried a lot of different approaches. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about ClojureScript. I didn't talk too much about ClojureScript, but ClojureScript provides some of these ideas. And, and the point here is not that you should use or not use ClojureScript. The point is um, it's possible to build a whole system around these ideas, and it can be very productive. So some things that ClojureScript does, uh, we have faithful ports um, of all the Clojure persistent data structures. We have them all. They compile to JavaScript. JavaScript people are, are using this without even, even having to use ClojureScript. Uh, we use the Google Clojure compiler, so we can, we can depend on many dependencies. Uh, the production artifact will only be the code that matters because of dead code elimination. Um, so we don't, we don't have the dependency problem because we said, the, the, you know, Java already has tools for dependencies. So all our, all our dependencies are in jars, uh, so you don't have to use a separate tool. You can, you can 
distribute your library as a jar and everything just magically works. Um, and we actually now have, um, we've, we're going out of the way to actually target a whole bunch of JavaScript runtimes. So a lot of, a lot of the tooling around things like uh, Node, they're often too specific to Node or they're too specific to um, Bower or whatever. And we didn't want to do that uh, because there are a lot of interesting places where JavaScript runs that we want to reach uh, and that our users want to reach. So we actually have um, setups that work for Rhino, that works for Node, uh, works for NASHORN, which is uh, Oracle's new JavaScript runtime, and it even works on iOS. So we have a, a functioning uh, ClojureScript build system in REPL. So you can actually, uh, actu well, I can't, don't have the demo today, but you can, without even having Xcode open, uh, you can actually um, develop on the fly, live, uh, against an iOS device, which is pretty cool. Um, so the other things that we're solving, so other things that are really important that I think people aren't talking about enough, so the GraphQL stuff is important, but something else that we maintain at Cognitech is something called Transit. I don't have time to talk about that today, but check it out. It's a fast, extensible data format encoded in message pack in JSON. So JSON is, is, has this great property of being everywhere. It has this horrible property in that it can't express the data types that you care about. Basic stuff like dates. There's no, there's no way to talk about dates. This is, is 2015, last time I checked. Um, so transit solves this problem for you. Uh, we have uh, encoders and decoders for Python, Clojure, Java, um, uh, JavaScript, ClojureScript. Uh, I believe there are community ones in Erlang, C Sharp, Haskell, Standard ML, so on. It's a very simple format and it allows you to write code and you don't have to tell uh, the person that you sent them a date. They're just going to get back a date, uh, which is nice. It also has built-in caching. So this is really huge. Uh, so we, uh, so the problem when you run a query, right? People write queries and they send it and then they return this huge array of maps, right? in which you have these long keys and they're all duplicated, right? So, so you have these huge payloads uh, uh, with redundant information. So Transit has built in, if we see a key and we've seen it before, we collapse it um, into like a two character thing. Um, but it's, it actually is extensible. Uh, you can even do more aggressive caching because the traversal order on read and write is the same. So you can actually cache entire objects. So you, can, you could send an entire object graph over the wire and all the places where the objects are that are, that are duplicated, you can replace uh, with an integer or whatever. And be again, because the read and write order is the same, um, caching just works. Uh, ClojureScript uh, actually tries to solve the async problem. If you've done a lot of JavaScript, there's a lot of interest around promises, and promises are OK. Uh, but there are a lot of things don't fit promises. A lot of asynchronous programming is stream-oriented. It's not promise-oriented. Uh, and we ship something called um, Core Async, which is uh, a version of, of Tony Horace CSP, Communicating Sequential Processes, uh, which allows you to, to really do very nice, elegant, uh, complex uh, asynchronous programming without losing your mind. Uh, and there's plenty, there's ton, tons and other stuff happening. Um, and actually, a lot of this stuff, again, it's not specific to ClojureScript. You're seeing um, there's, there's a CSP for JavaScript these days. Um, uh, there's actually growing interest in transit in the JavaScript world, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so again, none of these none of these things are specific to ClojureScript, but I think this is like represents um, a good architecture regardless of uh, what particular client technology you want to use. Um, and then there's a lot of exciting stuff happening again around JavaScript. So um, React actually announced this pretty neat thing called uh, React Native um, in January. And so it's actually what they did was so React was well designed enough that you could replace the renderer, right? Once you understand how React works, you're like, well, I kind of don't want to render DOM. I want to render something else. And so React Native uh, leverages the fact that the renderer is pluggable. And so instead of emitting um, DOM, it emits uh, Objective-C classes. And you can script the entire thing uh, from JavaScript. And so what they're building, and it's actually, it's really cool. It's, um, uh, they actually have React running on a thread, um, which is great because then the, the, the rendering is uh, threaded. I mean, one thread, of course, but still it's not going to stop any of your other logic. Uh, it's really cool. But it means that you can actually build an application for the web and you can ship uh, a, a more optimal experience uh, for Android and for iOS, uh, but the business logic can all be in JavaScript, which is great, which means uh, much faster turnaround times. Um, so there's a bunch of links. Uh, check them out. ClojureScript, Transit, Core Async, Datomic, React. Um, I should have added a link to Immutable JS, which is also really cool. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, but anyways, that's all I had for today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask. So, uh, 
something like Elm Crux tries to wrap up some of these things all in one package. Do you think that's a good idea, a bad idea? Is it better to keep it modular? Or what's your take on that? Uh, so Elm is, Elm is really cool. Elm is a typed functional programming um, language that targets JavaScript. Um, People are doing cool stuff with it. I mean, uh, the, the concerns of Elms are Elm is a little bit different than, than ClojureScript, where we try to we try to have an answer from everything from I'm just developing to I need a production artifact that's optimized. And Elm doesn't take go that far. Um, Elm does provide lots of other nice things that I think are <laughs> friendlier, to be honest. Like ClojureScript is not very friendly. It sort of assumes you're building something really serious um, and you're okay with some of the uh, the trouble you'll encounter. I think Elm is great. Uh, but I would love to see things like Elm and these other people that are combining JavaScript sort of take the production artifacts more seriously, and very few of them are. Oh yeah, so so it's 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 like it's you you pick your strategy, right? I mean, so for example, I mean, of course, <laughs> I maintain a library called Ohm, which is a, a layer over React that instead of using mutable data for because the way React works, it just uses mutable data as the the source of truth, and we I did a layer over it that get, uses immutable data as a source of truth. But of course, under the hood, we have to use mutation. I mean, it's not like you stop using mutation. Mutation is a tool. It's just that I the, I think the, uh, the the what I'm trying to say is that um, you need it a lot less than you think. I think most programs have far too much of it. Uh, so one, um, so let me actually show one other demo because I think this, oh, is it, is there possible to get audio up here? Yes? Okay, so. So there, there's a company called CircleCI, which is a continu integra continuous integration service, and they built their whole front end using um, Ohm, uh, which is the library that I wrote over React. Hi, I'm Daniel from CircleCI. But just to explain, so what he's going to show, uh, Ohm has this really cool feature that React doesn't have in which you can serialize the entire state of the program, and they use it to do this really cool trick where they can copy the entire state of the application and paste it into a different browser, and it will, it's exactly how it was. I'll do a quick demo to show you what's possible now that we've taken React State Service and mounted it into Ohm's global app state. So on the left here I have Chrome. I'm on the Add Projects page. I'm going to type something in this input to filter repos. And now this input is stored as component local state, so it's transient normally. Uh, I'm going to hit a keyboard combination to save the state. I took the global app state atom, serialized it to a string, and then stored it in this state string variable. Uh, this makes it easy to copy to my clipboard, and now it's in my clipboard. I'm going to come over to Firefox, I'm going to hit another keyboard combination. It's going to bring up this prompt. I'm going to paste the app state string in there. Uh, when I hit OK, it's going to take that string, it's going to deserialize it, and then it's going to reset the app state atom. And so you can see it's restored all the state, even the normally transient input state. Uh, so we're pretty excited about what we can do with this. Uh, you could, instead of sending screenshots to demonstrate a bug, just send the app state. Uh, if you have a designer, you want to show them an edge case, don't give them a list of steps to reproduce, just give them the app state. Yeah, no, this, this works. In every, this works. Uh, we actually go out of our way to maintain, I mean, so React, you're limited to IE8, but ClojureScript itself goes back to IE6. Yeah, so so what, what what's great about what's great about being a compiled to JavaScript language? So I don't know if you guys followed Coffee, CoffeeScript back in the day, but everyone was like, compiled to JavaScript, that'll never work. Um, but you have this problem now where the ES6 is coming, uh, and people want to actually use those ideas and those features today. So you have to transpile, like you have to compile JavaScript into the JavaScript that exists today if you want to use ES6 early. Um, and so what's happened because this is happening. Uh, browsers have implemented source mapping uh, universally. So every major browser has source mapping support, which allows you to take the original source and map it back to the one that you generated. So the debugging experience, it supports step debugging, and it's really, it's really good. Uh, we implemented source mapping um, 
about a year ago, and actually our source mapping support is more sophisticated than most. Than most. We actually support a source mapping through the production artifact. So a lot of times people only support it one step, but we actually support compilation to JavaScript, compilation to, ad to advanced compiled JavaScript, and you can, you can source map it all the way back. Other, other questions? Right. Thanks. Thanks.